Welcome back to Understanding Your Walk with God. It's a privilege to be with you again and to uh, share together with you. As we open tonight, I explain that we're going to be looking at Lesson 2 on Confession. Last week, we had a discussion together and a teaching on what it means to be born again and to become a Christian. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless the Spirit of God opens your eyes, Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom of God, and you certainly can't enter it. And Nicodemus was very confused, and we explained, essentially, that a person who lives on this earth between his birthday and his death day is in a temporal existence. But Jesus came in order to give us our lives back, because we are dying as a result of sin that has been in this world since the beginning. This evening, we want to discuss together what it means to confess my sin as a believer, as a Christian. But before I do, I want to just share one quick thought, and that is how can a person know for sure, with absolute certainty, that I have been born again by the Spirit of God? In order for us to uh, understand this, we have to go back and remember something that Nicodemus heard Jesus say in John 3, chapter 8. He, he told Nicodemus, who didn't understand this concept of being born again, that the wind blows wherever it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus used a physical analogy that he could understand to explain something about being born by the Spirit, of the Spirit, that he could understand, at least in some sense, what Jesus meant. The word for wind here is the same word for spirit, so Jesus is kind of playing with words. But in this verse is a very significant truth. Have you ever seen the wind? No, no, I haven't. But I know the wind is there. There are many things that we have never seen that we know exist. We believe in electricity. We believe in magnetism. We believe in gravity. So what Jesus is saying here, Nicodemus, just like you will never see the wind, but you will know it's there by the effects that the wind produces, so when you are born again, you will understand that there will be effects, changes that come in your life that God produces by his spirit. Uh, when I was a kid in high school, if someone had said that to me, uh, I would have had my hand up saying, uh, what are the effects? So I can know whether I've been born again or not. And it's very fascinating that John, who wrote the gospel or biography of Jesus, also wrote a letter many, many years later when he was an old man, and he is writing to new Christians to explain to them their Christian life. In fact, we're going to be looking at the first chapter of that book this evening. He said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And John had written a five-page letter saying, let me explain to you how you can know that you have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And as we study that, that, that letter, we realize that there's five or six major things that he says happens to a person who is born again. Number one, a person who receives Christ from that moment on begins to acknowledge their sin before God and confess it. Since the day you met Jesus, have you been confessing sin and recognizing it? Sin that you never recognized before? Well, congratulations, the Holy Spirit is in your life. He also went on to say in this uh, letter, he says that the person who, who has become a born-again believer, uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is a person who has come to see who Jesus is. The Son of Man who came down from heaven to be lifted up on a cross, the Son of God who would die in our place, who gave us his life, who took away our death and gives us access to God. Do you believe that? Is that your hope and your confidence? That's because the Holy Spirit showed you that. 
he also goes on to say that a, a person who's born again recognizes their own spiritual family is is really their true eternal family that their brothers and sisters in christ are their eternal family do you believe that fourthly he says that a person who's born again stops being so self-centered and self-focused and begins to see the needs of others and to care for them and to try to show the love of Christ in actual and practical ways. Do you do that? A person who is born again, John says, is a person who believes that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God and the eternal Judge who will come again in his second coming to this place where he died, where he came to bring us back to the Father. Do you believe that? And lastly, there is within a believer, someone who has been born again, a desire to become more holy every day, to become more pleasing to Jesus Christ, to seek to obey him above all else. If these things are true of you, you have been born again. It doesn't matter whether I feel I'm a Christian or I don't feel like I'm a Christian some days. No, it's a matter of the evidence. Now, in this lesson tonight, we want to look at one of those effects and a very important one, that a person who is born again is a person who personally admits and confesses their sin as a way of life before God. Let's begin by looking at this three circle diagrams just to remember and refresh our minds. Every person who is born is born in this circle. This chair represents the throne of the control center. I am running my life, my story, from my birthday to my death day. Someone comes along, the Spirit of God, personally, sends someone to speak to me about Jesus Christ, and my eyes are open to realize that he died on that cross for me, and I believe it. When I repent for having lived this way and received Christ, I leave my story to enter the story that God has for me in his son. And when I receive Christ and I, in one sense, enthrone him, bow before him, and the Holy Spirit communicates from Christ to me how I am to live. But it is possible for me to be tempted to go back like this, but not exactly. I, look, I can be tempted, I can sin, and when I do, the Holy Spirit says to me, Ken, you should not have thought that, said that, done that. And it is possible for me to recognize that what I have done is I have ceased yielding to the authority of Jesus and obeying him. But Christ does not leave me, and the Holy Spirit does not leave me, but rather I must repent for this thing, I must confess and I must be filled with the Spirit and get back here into circle two. Here's what John says to explain this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and is made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see, in this text, John is saying very clearly that we want to tell you about what we have seen and what we experienced. He's referring to we in that he is referring to the apostles, those <clears throat> who walked with Jesus from the time of his baptism until they saw him die on the cross and then saw him resurrected and ascended back to the Father. He's saying, listen, we touched, we handled, we saw eternal life in Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. We testify that to you. Eternal life, for many people, is not clear. Eternal life is knowing God personally through his Son, Jesus, through the work of the Spirit, and we are brought to his Father, who becomes our Father, the moment we come to faith in his Son. 
When I repent of my sin, I say my story ends. I'm not the boss anymore. I'm not running my show. I enter into a personal relationship with Jesus, and he becomes my life. That's what Paul said, Christ, who is our life. My life is now a life of submission to him as the Spirit of God directs me. He says, when I am living that way, I find fellowship with God. What does he mean by this term, fellowship? Very, very important to understand. In a Sunday school class one day, a little kid was uh, being taught, and the teacher said, does anyone here know what fellowship means? And one little kid raised his hand, and he's shaking his hand like little kids do, and he said, yeah, it's two fellows in the same ship. Kind of cute, but probably more accurate than we could understand. Two fellows in the same ship. Two people joined together into a relationship and a fellowship and a friendship with one another. John says, I want you to understand that we are in fellowship with the Son of God. We have been befriended by him. We have been loved by him. And he has brought us to the Father. And we are to be in that fellowship with friends. Just like in any ship, there may be two fellows, but there's only one person who's controlling the rudder and steering that boat where it should go. The issue of fellowship is this. Will I allow Jesus Christ to control my life? Will he be the one who I kneel before, the one who I obey, the one who I love? And the fact of the matter is, there are moments in my life and yours where we take the steering rudder of that ship and we steer it ourselves again. That is the essence of sin for a believer, breaking fellowship with Jesus Christ. Our Lord knew that we would struggle with this. He knew very clearly that we would have days when we thought we were smarter than he is, that we could find life better in ourselves again than in obeying him. And therefore, he made provision for us for confession. When we stood up to steer the life in the wrong way, we sin against him personally. This isn't breaking the law. This is disobeying a person whose name is Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. As we continue, let's go back to that circle diagram again and understand what that means. You see, when I become a Christian and I yield to Christ, and the Holy Spirit comes in to give me instructions. We might add between Christ and the Holy Spirit a book right there, called the Bible. And in that book, we are told everything. When Jesus was about to leave, he said to his disciples, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching to obey all that I commanded you. The work of the Holy Spirit in my life is to teach me the commandments of Jesus. And through the scriptures, I hear Jesus speak to me personally. I'm in the ship with Jesus, and he's running the show. But it's possible. It's possible for me to say, no, I think I can run it better. I think I'll climb up on the throne today and do what I please, not what he wants. I can sin. But again, sin for a Christian is not breaking the law. It's disobeying a person. And when I do, the Holy Spirit convicts me. And John says, there is a point where you must repent and confess in order to be filled with the Spirit and to be back in a position of where you are in fellowship with Christ. Let's continue with the text here and see what it says. Are we, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 
if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Notice one thing about this text. We, 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 okay, we, okay. You look through this text and it's we and us, we and us, we and us. He's talking to Christians. It is the Apostle John saying, since you have come to know Jesus, you understand what I'm talking about. And we must live a life in a certain way if we are going to understand our walk with God. Going back to this diagram again, he is saying very clearly that we can have complete joy when we are in this circle. He says, we can only have this kind of joy when we walk in the light. Well, light and darkness is a picture, obviously, of, of uh, sin and righteousness. Uh, obviously, you know, sin is what we do when we disobey Jesus. And he is saying, when we are in this position, submitting to Christ, listening to the Holy Spirit, studying his word, and we are seeking to obey it as best we know how, we are experiencing joy. But, however, if I yield to temptation and disobey my Savior and do this, I find myself not in joy, but I am in darkness, and I am not practicing the truth, okay? I am not living to, by, by what I know to be true about him and about me. John is saying emphatically, you can step out of the light into darkness. But know this, it does not mean that when I step out of the light into darkness that I cease being a Christian, that somehow I lose my relationship with Christ. Not at all. He is saying that if a person who steps out of the light into darkness and listens to the Holy Spirit's conviction, and repents, and confesses, and get back into a place of submission to Jesus, that person is walking in the light. None of us are in the light all the time. One day we, be, we will be when we get home to be with the Lord, but now we're fighting to stay in the light. But all God asks us to do is that when we have stepped into the darkness is to repent and to admit it, and to be filled with the Spirit, and to be back in submission and in fellowship with Christ. What's amazing is that when I do this, I say to myself, well, I've taken over control of my life. No, you haven't. <laughs> no, you haven't. The point is that Christ is always in control, even when I step here. Remember on the night that uh, Jesus was arrested, that he told the disciples, Peter and the rest, that, that they would deny him tonight. And they all said, no, 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 no. And Peter vowed and he made a great promise. And he actually found a sword somewhere there in that upper room. Maybe had brought it with him, knowing that they were coming to a showdown with the religious leaders of Israel. And when he went out there into the Garden of Gethsemane and the, and the, the, the temple police came and arrested Jesus, he said, with all of his sincerity, and he struck the servant's ear off, and Jesus told him to put it back and heal the servant. The point is this. He told Peter, you will not be able to keep all of your promises. But Peter, I always keep my promises to you. Peter, you may leave me, but I will never leave you nor forsake you. And in this diagram, we see what Jesus meant by that. That becoming a person who lives in submission to Christ is a lifelong learning experience. The point is that we must understand 
that this person who is submitting to Christ is experiencing great joy. That this person who is stepped out of light into darkness is in some sense miserable, frustrated, and feeling very horrible. This person, however, is in Christ and in fellowship. And this person is in Christ, but out of fellowship. When we put this all together, we realize that we need Jesus to protect us from ourselves. Christ is my Lord, my Savior. Christ is still my Lord and my Savior, even though I am not submitting him at that moment. This leads us to what I would like to introduce you to as a spiritual formula for living. A spiritual formula for living. The formula is this, R plus F equals joy. R stands for relationship. F stands for fellowship. When I am in a relationship with Christ because I have received him, I have been born again, I'm an adopted child of God, and when I am submitting to him and in fellowship with him, there is great joy. But if there is relationship which I have in Christ in circle three, but out of fellowship with him, doing my own thing, convicted by the Spirit, I'm experiencing shame. What I want to take a moment and explain the difference between having a relationship with God and having fellowship with God. The moment I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I was forgiven of all of my sin. I was adopted by God into his family. I have a relationship with God that will never change. People use the term personal relationship. You need to refine that understanding. God determined to adopt me, even though he knew I would not always be an obedient child. Uh, parents, you know this, you raise kids. You realize that there are days when your kids think they're smarter than you, but right? <laughs> they think that they're, they're, they, they know what they want and what's going to make them happy. From the time they're little, you begin to realize this rebellious spirit that's in them. How many people have had a teenage kid who looks at you and says, you're stupid, you don't even know what you're doing, and you don't understand me, and all that stuff? <laughs> Does that child cease being your child because the child is not in fellowship with you? <clears throat> no. But all oh, the joy of when that child who has a relationship with you is seeking to do what is right in your sight and you're trying to guide them in the way. Here's the point. When I receive Christ, the guilt of all of my sin, past, present, and future, he says, I'm telling you that you have no guilt. My son has removed all of your guilt. When a Christian who is seeking to walk with the Lord comes to me and says, he used to say to me, Pastor, I feel so guilty when I say this or do that, I would freak out. <laughs> I would look at that person and say, look at me. Are you telling me that what Jesus did on the cross was not enough to remove all of your guilt. You see, guilt is a legal term that says someone knows what the law is, they break the law, they're going to pay the penalty for it. The man who robs a bank with a gun will end up in jail and serve his sentence. If I served my sentence for my sin, I would be eternally separated from God. But Christ took my guilt away completely by his death on the cross and succeeded. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What I as a believer sense and feel and, and, and agonize over is not guilt, but it is shame. Guilt is I broke the law. I need to pay. Shame is 
I disobeyed the person who loved me and gave himself for me so that he could remove my guilt. We must understand the difference between shame and guilt. A Christian can never be guilty. I cannot be guilty because Jesus paid my sentence. But friends, there is a deep agony, is there not, when I find myself in rebellion against the Lord. But the Lord understands my weakness. The Lord understands my struggle. And he has provided for me confession as a way to remove that shame, to get out of circle three, and get back into circle two. Now let's think about some of the really important questions we need to ask ourselves as we bring this down to where we really live. First of all, when and how does the Holy Spirit convict me when I sin? Immediately. Immediately. I know. I hear. I do something and the Spirit of God says, now. Now. I say something and the Spirit of God says, you should not have said that. I even think something in my own heart and mind and don't say anything and don't do anything. And the Spirit of God says, you shouldn't think that. I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a personal example of mine. You, you, most of you know that I'm a carver and I make decoys. And uh, oftentimes when I'm intently making a bird, I'm bandsaw, which is a tool that makes cuts and curves. You probably know what it is. And I'll be cutting one of the most frustrating things is I'm almost finished with the bird and all of a sudden, you bam, okay, like this. You ever heard a, on an 18 inch bandsaw, a bandsaw blade break, it sounds like a shot out of a gun, it startles you. And when that happens, I immediately go, I won't tell you what I say in my mind, you know, it'd be embarrassing. But the point is, I get angry. And why am I angry? I find myself saying, I shouldn't have to put up with a broken pants all bloody. Why is this happening to me? I mean, do I deserve not to have any problems in life and struggles? The Spirit of God convicts me. And before I ever say anything, I immediately say to the Lord, please, I agree. I, I should not have thought that. You see, confession, the word to confess means to say the same thing or to agree. Confession for a Christian is not an agreement about some moral system. It's about me personally in fellowship with Jesus moment by moment. And when I hear the Spirit of God say, Ken, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. Confession's immediate. I could be in and out of fellowship. I could be in and out of shame multiple times in the course of any day. Because I'm trying to live in this friendly, submitted life with Jesus, a life that is to be pleasing to him. Incidentally, confession is not like, um, you know, two little kids in a home and they have a fight and the mother comes and says, now you tell your brother you're sorry. And you go, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good luck, mom. Until that kid comes to see what he did was wrong, you coercing him to confess will will produce nothing but hypocrisy. <laughs> no, confession is what is my ownership of what I have done and acknowledging it before God. It's when the Spirit of God says, this you shouldn't have done, and I, you're right. And immediately, I may go into circle three and come right back to circle two very quickly. It's a way of life. True confession goes beyond what I did wrong. I should not have stolen that. I should not have said that nasty thing about that person. Uh, I shouldn't have been so angry. Now, confession as we grow in the Lord will be this. Why did I do that? I can remember one time uh, the phone rang at eight o'clock in the morning and a friend of mine called and said, hey, Ken, where are you? And I Who's this? He says, it's Bill. 
Oh, I said, oh, hi, Bill. What's up? He says, uh, I'm at Manhattan Bagel waiting to have breakfast with you. <laughs> I had forgotten. Uh, I was tempted to say, oh, I'm sorry. I just got up and I, I really not feeling good this morning. Make some kind of nonsense excuse, okay, for, for forgetting. Now, there's two levels of confession at that point I can say to Bill. Bill, I'm sorry I forgot. That's a sin. But how about confessing it to this level? Bill, I wasn't even thinking about you or concerned about you because I know we needed to have a meeting together, but it was my fault that I didn't really care enough about you to keep it in my mind. Do you see how much deeper that is? As we learn to walk with the Lord, confession becomes deeper and deeper and deeper until it deals with the motives of my heart. It deals with honesty to the core of my being. God is faithful and just. It says when you live in that authentic way before God, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And as a result, we'll begin cleansing you, not in what you do, but in why you do it. Confession is a freeing experience to live in fellowship and joy. There's a couple of practical questions that people have asked me over the years that I think need to be answered. Someone says, yeah, but I have this one sin. I just can't seem to get rid of it. Just repeats over and over. I'm just so discouraged. I'm, I'm really a piece of garbage. There's, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm horrible. The first thing that I would say to that individual is you're right, you are horrible, you, you can sin, so can I, I can be horrible at times. I can deny the world in my life. Yeah, I sin is horrible, I agree. But you must understand something, that you are either in fellowship or out of fellowship with God. So a person who's dealing with a particular repetitive sin may say, this has got to be the second time now, the third time now, the fourth time now, how many times has it been? Friends, God is not keeping score. At any given moment, if you have committed a sin, such as a repetitive sin, and you confess it to the Lord, you're back in fellowship with him. And any confession down the road is not number two, number three, number four, number five. It's always zero or one. It's always I need to confess this, this broken fellowship. And if I will continue to honestly confess, even though it's painful and the shame may increase, I will come to realize that I need help. That like Peter, I can't keep my promises. I need this help of the Holy Spirit when it comes to the moment of temptation, not after I have lost it and yielded to it. And that will be our next lesson next week, which we'll talk about. But there's one last thing that I want to say that really is detrimental to the health of a Christian. In many Christian circles, there has been a teaching about penance after I've committed a sin in order to show my sorrow before God. I need to do such and such and pray so many prayers or do so much community service or on and on it goes. Most of us don't do that. We say, no, we don't believe in that. But we can enter into what I call psychological penance, where a person says, I'm not going to allow myself to feel right with God now that I did that for a day. And then it becomes two days, and then it becomes two weeks, and, and a person gets so defeated. There is no place for penance. Christ conquered the guilt of our sin through his death on the cross and through his resurrection. And God continually is faithful and just to his son and to us by washing away the shame that accumulates when we break fellowship. And when we begin to understand that kind of love that God has for us is when we begin to really change. So my friends, confession is the method through which God always brings me back into fellowship always brings me back into joy and always brings me back into freedom. Freedom for myself, freedom from my story, 
to let Jesus write his story through his life and his spirit in my life. I pray for you and I pray for myself that we may understand confession and the privilege it is to stay in fellowship with God. Next lesson will be a lesson on temptation. And you can prepare by reading James chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.